Thank you for joining us and welcome to another edition of Answers Network. I'm your host, Alan Cardoza, and each week this show will address many ways of creating greater health, joy, and love for you and those you care about. We will introduce you to top professionals and talented authors who are working to make this world a better place for all of us. Now, I'd really appreciate it if you could all do me a big favor. Please forward one of our shows to your social media group and to someone you know that can benefit from today's subject. This is one powerful way we can make a positive difference together. Now, I want you all to know that I am grateful that you take your time to listen to or watch this show, and especially those that send in questions, comments, reviews, and suggestions. Because please remember, this show exists for you. Now, if you haven't gotten your free copy of the Attitude of Gratitude journal yet, please go to our website at answers.network and download a copy. Give it 21 days and comment on whatever platform you listen to us on, what focusing on gratitude has meant for you and your loved ones. And if you would like to also send them to us via our website, we will read some of them on the air and ask for comments, or ask for people to, to see if they are having the same type of, of responses or the same types of changes in their life. Well, I think our guest today may just have something to say about gratitude and how it applies not only to our life, but to the afterlife. Um, because our topic today is also the title of our guest's new book, The Luminous Landscape of the Afterlife. Now, have you ever wondered, why are we here? Or what should you expect at death and for your transition? Well, this book provides answers to those questions and so much more. The author, Matthew McKay, is a clinical psychologist. He's a professor of psychology at the Wright Institute, co-founder of Haig-Ashbury Psychological Services, founder of the Berkeley CBT Clinic and co-founder of the Bay Area Trauma Recovery Clinic, which serves low-income clients. He has authored and co-authored more than 40 books, including the Relaxation and Stress Reduction Workbook and Seeking Jordan. Matthew, welcome to Answers Network. I'm glad to be with you, Alan. Well, it is my pleasure. Um, and I think we have a situation here where this is an area where I think so many of us have questions, but we don't know where to look. We don't know who to ask. Uh, and, and when we do, I think there's a variety of different uh, answers that people come up with that uh, may not necessarily be as, um, as thought out or as investigated as you have done. So share a little bit about your background and kind of where you were at before you decided to write this book. Well, uh, Alan, 13 years ago, uh, my son Jordan passed away. He was a uh, victim of a, of a shooting on the streets on his way home. He was accosted and, and died on the street. And I think as any parent would feel in that circumstance, I was desperate to know if uh -huh. on some level my son still existed. And if so, was he okay? And, and it just sent me on a journey to try to make contact with him, to begin some kind of communication, conversation uh, with uh -huh. him on the other side. So that's kind of what, got, what started me on this, uh, journey to communicate with the dead. Well, as a, uh, a psychologist, um, you know, you, you learn a lot of science. So um, was there any conflict uh, in you in regards to um, taking this journey? Well, 
Actually, no. I, I, didn't, I don't feel there's a, a, a conflict between science and spirituality in this area. In fact, in fact, there's quite a bit of science that supports the idea that there's an afterlife. And um, I can give you some oh, ideas. Yeah, yeah, well, what I was gonna- no, I was going to say, yeah, yeah, no, pl- please give some examples. And, and, and I definitely believe that. I just know that uh, there are some people that don't, you know. So I was wondering if you were one of those that struggled with that connection. Well, for most of my life, I was a, an agnostic. And I really mm-hmm. didn't pay a whole lot of attention to the possibility of a spiritual realm. But, uh, but the science is actually fairly compelling. We, we have uh, near-death experience, uh, science that tells us... Um, quite a bit about the, the people can leave their bodies and still remain conscious. And there's com- really compelling evidence mm-hmm. that people leave their bodies and see and experience things that uh, they could not have otherwise known about. Uh, the other, some of the other evidence comes from Ian Stevenson, who's a researcher at the University of Virginia. And he worked with children who remember past lives. Mm-hmm. And, he wor- and he worked with over 3000 children around the world remembered past lives. And in about a third of those cases, he actually solved who that child was as a previous personality and was able to confirm uh, the child's description of who they were, their names, their family, where they lived, what they, what their environment was. Mm-hmm. All of this he was able to confirm in about a third of the cases. So very compelling evidence that uh, not only can the can consciousness exist outside of the body, but consciousness can move from body to body over time, life to life over time. So there's a good deal of evidence. And then there's the evidence that was developed by, uh, by Michael Newton, who uh, did hypnosis to help re- regress people uh, to mm-hmm. the life between lives. And we, we had discovered a hypnotic process for that. And he did this with over 7,000 people before he ever published books, before anybody had ever read about Newton or, or, or what mm-hmm. he had discovered. And he did the special hypnotic process. He didn't lead them. He didn't tell them what to expect. And people described the afterlife in almost identical terms uh, across these thousands of individuals. So we have some some data to support the the existence of an afterlife uh, and that there is a possibility of communicating between this plane and the non-material plane. So how long did it take you to either teach yourself or in some manner learn how to communicate with your son? Well, the first thing I did uh, was see a psychologist named Alan Botkin. Mm -hmm. And he had stumbled on a technique he called induced after death communication. But really, it's just a small extension of something we call uh, EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. It's a treatment I use with my Mm -hmm. traumatized clients and uh, and he's found a small variation on this treatment that he he used with uh, clients who were in deep grief. Mm-hmm. And he found that these clients were able to actually hear in many cases see and in some cases feel the presence of their beloved and get uh, real communication. So I went to see Bach and he, he's in Chicago. Uh, about nine months after Jordan died, and I had that experience. I could hear Jordan telling me that he was okay, he was in a good place, uh, that he's watching over us, and so all the things that I needed to hear as a parent, I had the experience, and I heard it as an outside of my body. I could hear it as if it was being said right in the room. So it was a very powerful experience, and it really, as it does for many uh, individuals, helps mitigate the, the grief quite a bit. Uh, so that was the first experience, the direct experience I had. Um, and uh, a few months later, uh, I met with Ralph Metzner, who was a psychologist who recently passed mm-hmm. away, a specialist in, in the afterlife uh, and uh, exploring and learning about it. And he taught me a method of channeled writing. Uh, and he and one afternoon he taught it to me. I went home and I used it that night and I had the immediate experience of being able not just to have a one-way conversation where I was hearing certain things from Jordan, but to be able to have a conversation in which I could ask questions and respond and that he could uh, answer them. So it was a huge game changer, life-changing experience that I could start to communicate with him and learn 
from him, uh, not, not just um, w what was going on on the other side with him, but actually get a lot of advice for how to live this life. Um, and just uh, finally, I, I would say that, you know, he, he decided he, he wanted to write this book and get it out in the world because he felt that there's no better person to describe what the afterlife is than someone who's died and lives there. Wow, that's powerful. Um, when you first made this contact, I mean, it, try and describe the feeling because as you were saying it, I was actually getting heripulations on the back of my neck, just envisioning that first time that had to be incredible. It was, uh, I'm feeling it myself <laughs> as we're talking. I mean, the, the, the moment was probably perhaps the most powerful experience in my life uh, of, of hearing his voice, hearing him talk to me, hearing him reassure me that he was okay. Uh, and he he was with us. That was the other important thing that, that that he conveyed that his love continues regardless of whether he's on Earth or in the afterlife. That that love is unbroken. And and he really conveyed very strongly to me that that love is there. That he's watching over us. He's with us, uh, as well as able to support and and ultimately to talk to us. Now d define watching over you. Um... You know, I think that's one of the things that people think about, you know, what do you mean by watching over? I mean, is it, you know, you're able to have conversations and he's able to say things like, um, you know, the other day when you were driving down such and such a street, you know, and that car almost hit you, you know, you know, I tried to, to get your attention forward. You know, in other words, what did that entail, the idea of watching over? Well, first of all, what's really important to know about the, the relationship between ourselves here on Earth and people who've passed or in the spirit world is that they're just a thought away. Mm -hmm. If you think about that soul, you start to open the channel to them. You literally start opening the channel of connection. But the same is true on the other side. When they think of us, they are opening the channel of connection as well. And they can observe us. They can observe what's going on te telepathically. They can see what we're seeing, see what we're doing. Uh, and, and Jordan does pay a lot of attention to the people he loves uh, who are still incarnate. And he's watching their lives. But he also will show up in the, uh, and say, I mean, he'll say something to me like, don't say that. I'm about to say something that that might be hurtful or not make a lot of sense. And I mean, he will actually step in and say, well, you know, watch out for that. Don't do that. And it gives me a lot of advice about life and uh, choices that I'm facing. Mm -hmm. uh, he, has, he gives me advice about his sister, my daughter, um, and uh, his mom. And so, I mean, so... Watching over means literally paying attention to us, to, to what's going on with all the incarnate people he loves and stepping in periodically and actually intervening. Not so much that he's going to stop a speeding car, but intervening in the sense that he can support us to make better decisions. Yeah. And that's kind of what I was thinking, because I've, you know, I, I'm aware of stories, you know, of people who have you know, either been in a serious accident and 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 felt the presence of a loved one uh, getting them away from that situation or just having their attention shifted to where they all of a sudden now were looking in the right direction and made the right decision. So, uh, but the, you know, you talk about it, but you don't necessarily really believe it or know exactly what that was, but it is conversations that I've been involved in. Um, so, in the beginning, I mean, did you have did you have questions? I mean, what were some of the first questions that you had for him? Um, you know, obviously, first is how are you? <laughs> how are you doing? But was there also ones to where you almost felt like you needed to, um, you know, to confirm that all of this was, you know, was real? Um, you know, asking, you know, question, you know, you know, what was the name of your childhood dog, you know, or anything like that, that you felt you needed to, to, um, you know, to make absolutely sure that this is exactly what it appeared to be. 
Well, he, Jordan worked to confirm his existence on the other side in lots of different ways. I mean, first of all, we did see mediums mm -hmm. and uh, and the mediums would describe things to us that only Jordan would know, uh, that they could never possibly have that information, um, including very small events that would never ever make it in a newspaper or have a medium would have access to. Then we would have uh, dear friends who Jordan shows up to them in dreams and actually in various ways. In fact, on the uh, 13th anniversary of death, he, he literally showed up to someone as, as, as a vision, as a, as a, mm. a, a you know, a daytime vision uh, and gives them information about things that we're worrying about that they don't know about and says, tell dad, blah, 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 you know, and, and it's exactly what I've been struggling with. And, and they give the information uh, via Jordan. So there's so many ways uh, that he's confirmed his existence. I mean, uh, one other example um, is there's a medium that a dear friend of mine works with and has published um, who uh, doesn't, did, at the time, didn't know me, didn't know anything about Jordan, mm -hmm. and said to her, you know, you, you, there's somebody you work with and he has a son who died and He's writing a book with his son. No, at that point, three people in the world knew that. Uh, and it certainly wasn't the medium. And so <laughs> Jordan is able to show up in ways that are very deeply confirming uh, of his presence. And I, I just want to kind of mention that because, you know, this yeah. is, people worry, you know, it's like, is it, you know, it's just making up. Here's a grieving dad and he's, you know, having these hallucinations that his son is talking to him. Uh, but in fact, he's shown up to lots of different people in different ways and in, in so many ways confirming his existence in, in, yeah. in, with information that no one else would have. Okay. Um, so share with us uh, a little bit about, um, you, you mentioned that he's showing up with other people. That was actually going to be one of my questions is if that was happening. So uh, by what you just said, I was getting the feeling that he has also shown up now with his sister and and having conversations with her in the sense of of asking uh, or is she asking Jordan to tell you something or is Jordan asking her to have her tell you something? In other words, you know, how is how is that working? And if they didn't did they go to some of the same training or is this just happening? No, he, he doesn't uh, convey anything that I'm aware of okay. to his sister. And she does not feel very comfortable with uh, attempting to communicate to him in the afterlife. So that's not something she and I share. Um, you know, she still loves him and she thinks mm -hmm. of him, misses him deeply, and she not she is not really uh, very spiritually oriented in terms of, of him and the afterlife and what's out there. So, but he does communicate to quite a few other people uh, that we know, and and does it in a variety of ways. Uh, and and the, and the, when they report to us what mm -hmm. what he said, it's fascinating because what he says is always related to something we were struggling with that that person didn't know about that only Jordan knew about because he's observing our lives. So it's, it's been an amazing blessing the ways he shows up. Um, but having sort of in, in so many ways proved himself as, as really being there. Um, he has, you know, undertaken the, this opportunity to, to try to help other people. Right. And, you know, he's, he's, he's concerned with people who are really struggling with the fear of death. That's certainly something I've struggled with uh, personally. And he's concerned with people not really preparing for their death and not even and not knowing what's out there, not not having a sense of what what to expect after death. So that was really his purpose in putting out the luminous landscape of the afterlife. Um, I, I've got a question that's coming in right now. And this one. Uh, reads, um, please ask your uh, your guest if his son knows anything about what we're going through right now. And then and it says, you know, uh, loss of our freedoms, 
um, global control by elites. Um, and if so, what is his, has he made any comments about it or any thoughts as to how we will get through this? He has made comments. I don't know um, if it'll fit with, you know, the belief systems of, of the person who's asking, but uh, he's basically saying that we're in an era in which we are coming to terms with tribalism, with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, uh, people identifying only with their own group, with our, with, with their own religious group or their own little area of, of the world or their own nation or uh, so this this era of tribalism is really um you know and we're in the in the middle of, of a huge shift uh t toward the awareness of oneness and 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 the, there's a lot of you know kind of white water as we're trying to transition this this change from the only people I I care about you know, and are my tribe, and everybody else is suspect, and they, you know they're I don't know about them. To uh, to sense that we're all in this together, uh, and and we're we're not going to solve global pandemics until we're all in this together, uh, and uh, we can't solve it as small groups and um, someone who you know or 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 even as a single country. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we're moving toward awareness, and one of the things that's happening with these, with this epidemic and and the, the social unrest and so forth, is we're aware that um, there are a lot of people who are hurting, and and we have a relationship to them. They're not just out there; they're someone else. They're 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 us. They're, we're all we're all in this together. So that's one of the things. And he says that that process is happening. It's it, that shift is occurring, and it it's hard. We're you know, we're we're running up against a, a lot of um, pain and, and resistance to that shift. But that's what he suggests to me. Hmm. Um, I also want to touch on um, this ability that he has. Does he talk about other people having it? In other words, the thought is, is that why, you know, why don't we have, is everybody out there talking? If you think about it, if everybody was, um, it would be so loud we couldn't hear. So is there something special about him or is there something special about where you've been able to train yourself to go to, to be able to receive? You know, our loved ones on the other side mostly do want to be in contact with us. Um, and so, so that's, it's not, that's not a universal, but that, but in general, Loved ones on the other side want to have some contact with us, and and they can. The problem is that we often don't. We're not receptive. We're not. Um, we're not tuning in, and and so and yet I know lots and lots of people who've learned to channel, uh, mm -hmm. who who've lost loved ones, learned to channel, and it's and it's changed their lives as it's changed my life. So most people can do it. Most people can actually connect and listen and begin to have conversation with their loved one. Um, and you don't have to be clairaudient or have any special qualities, any nice. abilities, which I do not have any of those abilities. And, and yet people without those abilities can channel and get tremendous sense of relief uh, and comfort from, from connecting. Uh, and it's not that hard. You can learn to do it in five minutes and you can start doing it uh, almost immediately. So I guess I want to encourage people that if you want to have contact with someone you love and deeply need to hear from on the other side, in most cases, you can do it. I mean, even if you want right now in the show, I can describe how to do it because it is. Well, what what I would like to do because we're we're coming up on a break, um, but um, which this gives us a great thing to have everybody stay with us. Okay, so we're going to take a break, but when we come back, um, Matthew is going to sort of walk us through how we can all learn how to channel our loved ones that are out there in the afterlife. So 
Stay with us. You're listening to Answers Network, and we'll be back in one minute. Founded over 30 years ago to meet the needs of families in crisis, West Shield has continually focused on resolving issues that negatively impact families and businesses. Our signature therapeutic transportation service helps to ensure that adolescents in crisis are safely transported to specialized school programs and treatment centers with unsurpassed experience and success. We are supported by our full service licensed investigation agency that has legally, professionally, and compassionately located hundreds of runaways and teens. We are experienced and qualified to help, offering solutions which may include referrals to our international network of top professionals in the fields of educational consulting, psychology, psychiatry, and investigations. Simply put, West Shield Adolescent Services and West Shield Investigations are the best solutions when your family is facing a personal crisis. Call 1-800-899-8585, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's 1-800-899-8585, or visit our website at westshield.com. Thank you. We're back. Uh, we are with Dr. Matthew McKay, and we are talking about his book, The Luminous Landscape of the Afterlife. And when we went to break, I asked him, can you walk us through a little bit of channeling? He said it'd take maybe five minutes or so, but we're going to talk a little bit about how we can all reach out to communicate with one of our loved ones. So if you want to learn to channel, this is something, as I said, I've, I've taught probably hundreds of people, but, but, off, but where it's meant the most to me is uh, my own clients are dealing with deep grief experiences and uh, for them to learn to communicate to their loved one is has made a huge difference in the level of grief and in their even their sense of what life is about you know why are they here why did they go through this loss why 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 do we face this kind of pain in our lives and so uh, channeling often helps with those questions as well so if you want to do it um, <clears throat> there's a simple process. Get you know, find, ch channeling is helped by rituals. So find a a, a, a chair, or a, a play, a desk, a, a place that you're very comfortable, that you feel very at ease and at home in that in that spot. Uh, you want to get something, uh, a talisman of some so sort that connects you to that loved one. Something perhaps that they owned or something that they gave you, but it's it's a physical object. That connects you. So you want to have that present. You also want to have a notebook, you know, for, for writing your questions and your answers. Uh, as you get started, you it's very helpful to have something for eye fixation, and it's a candle. Uh, works great. I use a candle. Just looking at the flame, dancing and moving in the air currents, it has a kind of relaxing uh, effect. But it also begins to um, kind of op open the door a little bit. Uh, to an altered state. Now, as you notice the candle, uh, you can move into uh, a, a a simple meditation. This is, this is a simple breath-focused meditation, and you breathe in, and and as you breathe out, you just count one. And as you breathe in and breathe out, the next time two, and breathe in, breathe out, it's three. And you and and often and I'll go you know go up to ten breaths and if you you know still feel like you really want to go a little deeper take another 10 or even another 10 and and when thoughts start to emerge just say say yourself oh there's a thought but let me get back to my breath and just return to the breath so you're 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 noticing your breath you're you're bringing your attention down to your diaphragm where you're breathing you're counting each out breath and when thoughts intrude you're bringing your attention back to the breath. And that it's as simple as that. It's just a very simple Vipassana meditation. And that opens the door. You're about to say something. No, yeah, I was just going to say that, um, yeah, it's very simple. It's very similar to, you know, a, a basic simple meditation. Um, and you're just opening yourself up is the way that I'm envisioning it. But one of the questions that came to mind while you were saying that is, can loved ones connect together in the afterlife so in other words you know can he connect with 
you know, great grandpa, you know, or, you know, someone else uh, from his life. Has he talked about that at all? Oh, yeah. Okay. So he's he's got connections there as well. He's very connected to my mom who passed uh, before him. Uh, he has other relationships there that are very deep. And so we, he has some connection to my father. So he's actually um, has a whole cohort, a, a whole group there that he is very closely involved with. And sometimes I hear a little bit about them, but when you're channeling, it's really helpful to focus on one entity on the other side, because mm -hmm. you get kind of confused with, with different voices coming up. So just be clear about the address you're sending your message and your question. You're sending it to this particular soul uh, on the other side. So once you uh, have gone through the meditation and you're feeling yourself quiet a little bit, there's a very simple visualization that helps to open the channel. You just imagine, uh, a, 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 an orb about the color of the sun, just a little bit above your head. And then visualize that orb elongating and stretching up from the top of your head all the way to the soul you're wanting to talk to. And, and now the channel is opening. Uh, the meditation has quieted you, it's prepared you, it's made, you've gotten more receptive, you're in a, a slight altered state, you open the door with this visualization now at this moment what you want to do is write down your first question literally write it down watch the words form on the page as you write down the question mm -hmm. uh, it's very important to write it because it helps you focus your attention and also send the message and then and then wait uh, and allow whatever shows up to show up uh, oftentimes in the very beginning of channeling uh, when you're just getting started a few words will show up don't worry about whether it makes sense or doesn't make sense. Just write them down, whatever it is that showed up, and then wait a little bit. And eventually, a few more words will show up. The sentence, you'll finish the sentence. Keep waiting, and maybe an, another sentence or two will show up. Right. So what, what I'm suggesting is to be really passive, but whatever shows up in your mind, that's okay. That's what you write down. Um, just trust that something will show up. And if you just keep waiting, eventually it'll string into uh, something that makes sense, into a sentence or more sentences that make sense. Sometimes what shows up is just a, a, an idea, and then you have to find the language to describe it. So that, that can happen too. Uh, and then sometimes there's, we get what I, what I think of as a download, where just a whole string of, of words will show up and just, you can barely keep up with them. But however it shows up, it's okay. And just allow the next word, the next sentence to show up. When, you, when there's a little bit of quiet, then you can write your next question and wait for the answer. So in a way, that's that's the process. It's it's simple. Mm -hmm. But you're going to find, and also it's very important to record all the answers to the questions because you're going to want to look back at that. It's going to mean something to you right. to look back and see all of the things your loved ones said to you. Uh, I, I look back and review a lot of what Jordan has said to me. And it, it always means something. Even I may have forgotten it. It may have been several years ago. And it's, but to look back and re review it is very um, meaningful. And you can ask your loved one, you know, to tell you to tell you about what's going on for them in the afterlife, to describe it to you. Uh, you can ask them why they left. You know, why they died. What 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 you know? What spiritual conditions led to that? Um, well, have you asked him in regards to? What is an average day for them in in this life that they are currently in? Yeah, I, I have, you know, uh, and, and an average day involves quite a lot of different possible activities. Um, the, the activities in the in are usually conducted in a soul group, which is a small group of, say, eight to 20 souls. Jordan has a soul group there. Uh, they have particular things that they're learning. So a lot of what they do is they're learning. And you can almost think of it like, like classwork, where guides are helping uh, souls uh, review and learn things that are important for them. Um, hmm. Also, there's a fair amount of visiting. Uh, souls visit each other in the afterlife. Uh, hmm. And they also um, are visiting with and paying attention to embodied souls, us here on Earth. So, so they're visiting in different ways. Um, another thing they do is tourism. 
uh, souls in the afterlife actually go and visit other planets and other places and they study them to see uh, what life is like there. Well, that's it, which is another another great point is, you know, many religions, you know, believe that based on how you've been in this life may determine where you end up in the afterlife. Uh, has he talked about that? Are there different places where different people go? No, no, uh, actually not. There's no judgment in the afterlife. It's not like you, you live this life and you're getting evaluated as to whether, you know, it's a, a pass fail system or whether, you know, you can get into heaven or you, you mm -hmm. go to the hot place. It, it really uh, is not like that. Um, souls, when they return to the afterlife, when they return to the spirit world, go to their soul group, uh, whatever they did in their life, uh, however successful the, that life may have been in terms of the th things they were learning. Now, when souls arrive at the gateway to the afterlife, right right after a, a, a particular life, a particular incarnation, uh, they may have all kinds of residual um, emotions and and pain from the just lived mm -hmm. life. Um, they may have a lot of confusion. They they, they may have beliefs yeah. that make it hard for them to figure out what's going on here. So there's often there there are healing places that are just adjacent to the spirit world where souls go to to, uh, to heal their their so their soul energy uh, from this just completed very difficult life or to heal uh, these emotions that they're bringing with them uh, from a difficult life or a life where they may have inflicted harm on others bringing a lots of anger with them for example so none of these emotions can make it into the spirit world proper so there's just a lot of healing that could be done but this this is not punishment uh, this is not mm -hmm purgatory where they have to suffer in order to atone for their sins. Uh, these are just places where they go to heal, to recover, uh, and then they move and matriculate into the afterlife proper. So has, has Jordan had any conversations in regards to past lives? That's another point that many people discuss and wonder, you know, have we had past lives? And if so, you know, what were we? And it's interesting because I was having a conversation with someone recently and I said, have you ever noticed that when you talk to somebody about a past life, they were always somebody very special. <laughs> and if we were all somebody very special, I guess nobody was just the average person, you know, so no, nobody was tilling the field. And, exactly. And, nobody was you know, actually working. Yeah. You know, they were, you know, they were, a, a you know, a, a king or a, you know, a, a priest or, you know, or something that, that, uh, that was, that was interesting. Uh, even if it was somebody that was bad, they, it was always something that, um, is notable, notable. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Let, let me just say this, uh, you know, I've done a lot of, um, life between life regressions uh, mm -hmm. that I told, mentioned Michael Newton in the seventh thousand. Right. I learned how to do those regressions. And the way you get into the life between lives is you go to immediate past life and you take a look at that and then you progress somebody to their death in that life and then into the life between lives. So that's the, the process. So you're always doing some kind of past life work uh, as part of a life between life regression. Um, and I know uh, uh, people in the Newton Society who've done hundreds and hundreds of these. Uh, and and nobody is anybody important in a past life. You know, none of none of the my the folks I've worked with were, were any. You know, there there were one was a slave, one was a, a laundry woman, one was. I mean, I can't even tell you. Um, one was a little girl that got murdered. I mean, mm. the, there's this idea that you know people you know this sort of aggrandizement that you know oh, I must have been somebody important. Uh, not true, you know, and, you know, Ralph Metzner also worked with me and did some past life regressions and, and believe me, I was nothing important. And, um, but what was interesting about that is that I've had a number of past lives with important people in my life now. And for example, I, I had a past life in the uh, 1700s, I think, as a, as a, as a bookbinder and, uh, Jordan was my wife in that life. So we had a very different relationship with father, son, this life, uh, husband, wife in that, in that life. 
Um, in another life, we were in a, a, a Middle Ages yeshiva, and he was an aged rabbi who mentored me, and I was a young firebrand rabbi who got in a lot of trouble um, for communicating with him, by the way, <laughs> after death. I, got, I really got uh, in, in deep trouble with the, the community there. So anyway, and I'm, there are other lives. And yeah. it was a life in which uh, I was a woman, and he was uh, an unrequited quite a love of mine. So we've had lots of interactions over past lives. And, um, but there, but each life we're learning something, we're working on something. And what I've been working on in, in a lot of my lives is dealing with loss. And, um, and Act Jordan has actually been a, an important part of that. For example, in my life as a bookbinder, my wife, Jordan died early in that life. And, and I reacted with life with loss by just shutting the memory out, shutting people out, out people out, that 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 uh, that were somehow leaving or gone, uh, just shutting out all love for, for that, uh, and and so I've had a lot to learn about how to hold on to love in the face of loss, and that's one of the the things I've been working on over over a course of lives. And we come to Earth. The way, what Jordan tells me is the the reason we come to Earth is to learn. Mm -hmm. It's not to be proven worthy of heaven, uh, not to not to you know, uh, pass the test, but rather we all come with a lesson plan and, and what we don't finish learning in one particular life, we continue with lessons that will help us work on that same, um, thing that we're trying to discover in the next life and the next and so forth. So, and, but it's not like, you know, if you screwed up in this life, you're punished with something in the next life. You know, if you're if you know if you treated somebody meanly, you come back uh, uh, as a as a as a victim in the next life. I mean, that could happen, but it's not punishment. It's about learning. Every life is about learning. That's why we come here. It's a sacred mission. Jordan tells me uh, to mm -hmm. learn as much as we can and take all of what we've learned back to the afterlife with us. So, um, so. Will Jordan um, reincarnate? So where he is at now, if there are past lives, that would suggest there are future lives. Um, is you know, does his soul stay there, and he's still able to go? How does that work? I'm struggling with that one. This, no, that's a great question. <clears throat> Jordan is already reincarnated. He's a little girl, uh, and I sometimes he kind of lets me in on what what's going on in that life. You know, he's had some struggles. He's growing up with a single mom. Uh, and um, feels a lot of aloneness, and uh, but and what you're saying is important because it is also true that part of our soul always remains in the afterlife. Part of my soul is in the spirit world right now. Part of uh, Jordan's soul, even though he's incarnating again, is in the spirit world. Your soul, part of it, remains in the spirit world, and we divide our energy. Uh, Hindus talk about Atman and Jiva. That that there's a that, that there's the part that that comes and 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 enters a physical form, and there's the part of us that always remains in this, in, in the afterlife and actually remembers all of our past lives, has all of our wisdom, and sometimes you know. If by the way, if you want to channel, you can channel to yourself in the in the spirit world. You can channel to your highest awareness of of, of yourself. So anyway, I just want to encourage you to uh that the, the address that you can send your message to is you <laughs> in the afterlife because part of us always remains there well we have another question that is coming in and again i appreciate those that take the time we have a couple actually that have come in uh prior to the show and i want to get to those as well but this one reads um uh, what about uh ghosts or spirits that um, remain in houses. They, it says that there are so many um, uh, things that they have read or seen where people talk about the fact that there's a particular spirit that stays in a particular house. Is there any significance to that? It's true that that happens. Um, some souls after death are say very caught up in the drama of their life or in the drama surrounding their death. And they may continue uh, to remain in that place, uh, even though they're, in, they're, they're no longer physically, uh, 
Mm -hmm. Trust they may remain in that, their consciousness may remain in that place for a period of time. Some souls don't even know they're dead. And, and it's, it's actually, there's a period of time in which they really struggle to figure out, oh my God, I'm, I don't have a body anymore. And they're, they're confused. Some souls don't, uh, you know, don't believe in an afterlife and they're, and they can't, they don't get it. You know, why am I still conscious? I, my body's still lying there and I'm still con So souls may remain, you know, Joel, even Jordan remained for a period of hours after his death. It's just kind of traveling around, coming home to see us, uh, other people he loved, visiting them, not able to communicate, um, pretty disturbed really uh, by this sudden change of, of losing his body and and so even he who's who's a pretty aware soul uh was for a period of hours clinging to this plane and now other souls may do it for days some may do it for months uh it's a rare soul that really gets stuck here for super long time uh eventually they feel the tug of of, of being pulled toward the afterlife toward the spirit world and they begin to give in to that tug and allow, and allow it to take them. But souls sometimes resist that tug or don't even notice it because they're so taken up with the drama of the immediately ending life. So Matthew, first of all, I got to tell you that I, I, I am loving this and I you know, wish that we had more time. I just glanced over. We've got about three minutes and we've got two questions that were sent in ahead of time. So I'd like you to give us as much of an answer as you can. And if there's something of greater uh, depth that you would like to go into, uh, I'd like us to give your um, your website or somewhere or your social media that you can give to where maybe the answer can also be posted there that people can get something a little deeper. Is that fair? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, uh, so this one reads, it says, um, I'm sure that losing your son was a devastating event. Uh, were you already involved in anything to do with meditation or mindfulness before this happened? I am curious how you connected to your son in such a powerful way and what kind of information and guidance uh, you feel he has given you. <laughs> uh, can you give a little information on what your son said about why we are here and what to expect when we cross over. And this is from Marianne in Maryland. Why we're here is to learn. And when we cross over, what I want you to know is to expect that you're gonna be greeted with love. You're gonna be greeted, you're gonna be held, you're gonna be taken care of. If you need some healing, you'll get healing. Um, but all you have to do is tune to love. That's what you need to do at, at, at the moment you're aware that you've, you've crossed over. Just focus on love. Focus on those you love in the afterlife. Focus on those you love who are still incarnate. Just hold love in your heart because love is what how all communication occurs in the afterlife. So that's that's really important to, to keep track of. Okay. You know, and I've got an idea. Okay. So for everybody out there, just start focusing on love now because you don't know when this time is going to happen. But if you're already focused on love, you're going to be all set. So why don't we try it here on earth right now? and then take it with us. There's a simple meditation. Breathe in love, breathe out fear. Breathe in love, mm -hmm. breathe out fear. Yeah, and that's like the best preparation we can have for moving to the afterlife. Well, and speaking of fear, we have another uh, question that came in and it says, I think that uh, fear of death is why we're so obsessed with possessions. Uh, as if physical things will solidify our existence here. A few years back, I started a daily meditation practice. It took patience, but eventually I felt connected to the next dimension and less connected to the physical plane here. I could feel family on the other side all around me. That experience enhanced this reality as well, as I felt more present and uh, more present in and appreciation for nature and greater love for everyone in my life. In essence, combining the two has made me a much happier person. What are your thoughts on what I am doing and what other suggestions do you have to expand or enhance my connection to the next dimension? And then after that, it says, I can't wait to hear your answer, your interview with Alan and read the book. And this is from Allison in Florida. So I think meditation is a great preparation for, um, higher awareness of the afterlife. I started doing meditation uh, a number of years before Jordan died. And even before he passed away, I 
had, you know, this what's called insight meditation. I had this kind of blinding awareness at one point during meditation that uh, uh, that we're all connected. The living and the dead, we're all connected. The love unites us entirely. We never lose anyone. And it was just like, it hit me like a, a ton of bricks. And I, so meditation can prepare you for a, a greater openness to the afterlife. So I, I totally support that. Uh, and it also can be something that you can use. And the, the you know, I, I heard the question about, well, what else can you do? It's something you can use as the basis of doing channel communication with, with souls in the afterlife or with your own soul in the afterlife. So again, meditation is a platform upon which you can build so much awareness. And I really encourage people to, to use that. It's, it's very powerful tool. Matthew, thank you so much. Um, now, um, if somebody wants to get in contact with you, what is the best way to do that? Well, you can just send me an email. It's Matt, M-A-T-T, at newharbinger.com, N-E-W-H-A-R-B-I-N-G-E-R.com. All right. And if any of you are driving out there, we'll have it on our website, answers.network. We'll have that information and how to reach Matthew. Uh, Matthew, I assume the book can be gained it through any bookstore, Amazon online, anything like that? All of those, all of the above, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Um, it's, I think this is a subject that, that so many people don't know where to turn. And I think by putting this book out, I think you're going to help a lot of people. So it's much appreciated. Thanks so much, Alan. All right. And for everybody out there, please join us next Monday when we will be joined by Jeff, Kathy and Kara Long. They are the founders of Teens for Teens Help. Uh, and in our interview, they will discuss their mission to become the largest movement of its kind that will positively impact the lives of thousands of teens and their families ac across the country and globally. Now, also, I'd really like everybody to please visit our our archives of past interviews at answers.network. And you can subscribe to our show through iHeartRadio, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, YouTube, Spreaker, Beat You, uh, uh, Huge Tube, uh, and many other popular podcast platforms. If you like what you hear, please leave a review. It will help us reach more people. And I want you to know we greatly appreciate it. So for everybody out there, be good human beings and be with us again next week on Answers Network. Hello, I'm Marty Cove. You might remember me from roles such as Sensei in the Karate Kid films. I've done over 100 films and countless stunts in my career, and I've always given 100%. With the damage done to my body over time, I needed to find relief from my chronic pain. My passion for health and fitness drove me to find a natural way to combat muscle pain. Teaming up with doctors, detectives, and a compounding pharmacist, We've created Marty's Cobra Cove Ultra Strength CBD Cream. It's the only thing that has been strong enough to knock out my pain. And fast. Honestly, you may have tried the rest, but it's time to try the best. It's legal, it's safe, and 100% effective. Show your pain. No mercy. Go to www.martyscobracove.com.